Manufacturer, I suppose, um, for quite a long time now. So I wanted to kind of show, talk about some of the myths as I see them of some of the what small manufacturing can be like. But we'll sort of start with um, start with that. Not working. Size. There we go. So um, I think basically the, the standard narrative for manufacturing is that you know you come up with an idea, you decide you want to make stuff for a living. Uh, and then you've got two options. Like you can become a kind of master craftsperson um, and make stuff by hand, and um, and then you're going to have to sell it at quite high premium because you're yeah. There's a lot of labour involved in all of that, um, and so there's loads of people doing that kind of manufacturing, making stuff, selling it on Folksy and Etsy and places like that, or just at, you know craft fairs and all those sorts of things. And then the other option is that you can be like okay. This thing, you know, I want to make this sort of cheap and accessible, so we're going to make loads of it. So we're going to have to mass manufacture things, um, and so that then leads you into like, well, you're probably going to raise venture capital in order to pay for all of your injection molding and stuff like that, and the fact that you're going to be selling thousands of things in order to get the kind of bill of material costs down enough to do some things to you know to, to make all your electronics and stuff like that. Um, and you'll be burning through your venture capital money pretty quickly, um, but you know, that's kind of okay because the change is getting ever faster. We're seeing all of these you know, new technologies getting adopted quicker. So if you've got an idea, you best get out into the market really quickly because otherwise you'll be yesterday's news and like nobody wants to buy your thing. Everyone will move on to the new buzzword and give it up on the old buzzword if you're too slow getting stuff into the market. Um, and that probably means that you go to China uh, because they're the people who can iterate quickly on manufacturing things. Um, they're also the few places where you can do stuff at scale uh, and where most stuff is made. You know, stuff isn't made in the UK anymore. It's all made out in China. You need to just make, you know, you're making lots of it. You'll be booking uh, trips to Shenzhen um, to go and look around with things. Um, and you might be on an accelerator program which is helping kind of manage some of that sort of stuff. Because um, hardware is hard, um, making real things is super difficult. Um, so you need you know, whatever help you can you can manage to get. And there's loads of this because you're innovating. You'll be, as I say, you know, you'll have talked to a VC. You'll have joined some sort of accelerator program, which is going to take you through like a three-month sort of kind of um, boot camp to get you investment ready or to help you kind of find the partners in China. And it's, you know, that's all okay because there's lots of support programs, the LEP, um, the catapult systems, like the, 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 you know, the digital catapult, the high value manufacturing catapult. It's kind of what the government you know, is there trying to help us because we want the UK to be so you know, innovative and we need to be moving towards kind of higher value manufacturing because that's, that's the answer and what we're going to do with things. And that's kind of the standard narrative of how we're supposed to do you know, growing a business, being a startup, um, and I, I'm just not sure that that's always the case. Um, you know, I think there's a whole load of myths in there that, like, 
I suppose I'm trying to challenge and I'm going to explain a bit more about what I think some of those things are. So the first myth is this is the missing middle, like the fact that you can only do like really small scale bespoke manufacturing or mass manufacturing. There's nothing in the middle. Um, and like that's just not true. There are loads of companies in the middle. Like, you know, we've got Keith is going to be speaking later on, um, and it's Paul from Pimeroni here as well. Like they, they're a younger e example of that. Try and Lily over the road make most of the women's police helmets in the UK, like 100 yards from here, in a little unit that if you didn't really know from the outside, you wouldn't realise. Um, like, and it seems to be kind of a UK thing. I don't know if it's like a class thing or something, that you're, it's okay to make stuff like on your own as a sort of almost near, like not a hobby, but you know, that kind of tech end of things, or you're allowed to be the kind of like owning a factory and being a big corporate. And like in the middle, it's like, well, you're obviously not successful enough to be a big proper like owning classes, um, and it's a bit too much like there's going to be actual working classes involved in kind of making some of this stuff. So I don't know, in the UK, or maybe it's like an Anglo-Saxon thing, I'm not sure, there's this sort of missing middle bit, that was, there's just no visibility. Um, and I think we need to get more stories out of the people who are there, um, and get them better known so there are role models for the rest of us to be like, oh, okay, there are some people around here doing stuff as a kind of medium scale. I mean, like Germany has the middle stand, which is that kind of like medium-sized businesses, lots of it. Italy, similarly, there's just much more visibility of the kind of small, like design and manufacturing firms. You know, you like in the car industry, you've got Pininfarina and Bertoni, who are like design firms, who are just as equally priced as Fiat and Lancia and Maserati. So. Yeah, like, I think the middle's there, we need to celebrate it more. And then there's a myth that the UK doesn't make anything anymore. And, you know, it's true and not true, and that's a terrible slide projected. Uh, there's a map of the world behind there. It's like, can you spot the different bits? Like, China is over here, um, and the Far East. So, yeah, some stuff you can't get in the UK anymore. This is from some research that I did for Hannah a couple of years ago, where I was making, working out how much stuff we could make locally. Um, and some of the stuff you can make locally, you can get PCBs manufactured locally, but all of the electronics components, they mostly come from the Far East. Like, not just China, um, there's all sorts of, you know, Japan and Vietnam and um, Hong Kong and, yeah, loads of different bits of the, uh, of the Far East. Um, apart from, like, push buttons, they're from France, the ones I bought randomly. Like, I don't know why France has got this like, push button thing. Um, but there were, you know, we, as part of that research, we went around and found lots of the local firms. Um, and there are loads of firms in the UK making stuff. They're just kind of hidden away on industrial estates. And nobody really knows about them until you get to know one of them. And then they, you unlock this network where they're like, oh, yeah, you need to chat to so-and-so. Um, like, oh, we can't make those sorts of things. Go, and, go down the road and like, go and see them. They've got the right kind of machine. And once you get into the network, you start to know where these people are. And like maker spaces are a good way into the network. Um, they all kind of open stuff up to you because different people do different projects. So somebody needs to die cut boxes, another person needs to get some like wood CNC, things like that. And you start to build up these networks. And then there's the myth of like you've got to move quickly or like it's going to be too late. This is the first Acker's Bell that I made for um, a company called Scrapewiki over on the Science Park. And it rings every time they get a new sale. And I made that in 2012. And that was a few years into my um, kind of building my business um, to do internet things. And I you know, deliberately went for bootstrapping it rather than growing it with like VC funding or something. I could have gone and got VC money and then I'd probably have joined one of the other internet things startups that was kind of a bit early and then crashed out because the market wasn't quite ready, stuff was a bit too expensive. You know, this is now the Acres Bell that I'm still in the process of getting to market because you know, I'm bootstrapping, so client work gets in the way. And you, know, you try and pick the client work that will take you in the right direction towards learning new things that you can apply in your product development. Um, but some of that intervening time just means that the market can kind of catch up with you. Like when I was working with Alex on Goodnight Lamp in the very early days when we were looking at Wi Fi stuff, we couldn't find a Wi Fi module for less than 12 quid and like the Wi-Fi module and processor that's in that is like less than two quid and that's just China's kind of caught up and gone oh you want to make that sort of stuff do you right we can do those really cheap yeah 
um, which then means that the kind of the economics start to stack up much more than they would have done if I was trying to do this years ago. Um, and then there's the kind of you know all these support programs and accelerators and kind of you know people like Kathy, although not people like Kathy as well. Um, <laughs> Glad you said that. <laughs> I, mostly, it's you know, there's lots of people who will tell you that they can help out with all your stuff, and you need to work out. You know, unfortunately, a majority of them, I think, are very good. They're looking at you know, you'll you'll fulfil one of their outputs um, rather than them necessarily helping you. Um, and you know, they get paid to have meetings. You don't, as a business owner. And it's working out that kind of, you know, realising that there are good people within those communities, Kathy being one of them, and that, you know, it's getting to know people <laughs> and building the, um, the relationships with them. So as Kathy says, we've like, known each other for years. Um, and so, you know, she'll help where she can, and if she can't, she'll tell you. And she's not going to waste her time trying to get you signed up to some programme that isn't suitable and that you're not going to want to do. And there are people around there, it's always about the people. And there are people working in those sorts of organisations, but a lot of them aren't doing useful stuff. They're just trying to fill their like spreadsheets so they get their funding. And it's you know it's easy when you're starting out to think that they're going to help you lots. And it's mostly I suppose I'm just like you know just bear it in mind when you're engaging with them. And like hardware is hard, and I think this is a myth because it's like it's a sort of weird dichotomy where. Like, hardware's actually super easy in some ways because there are maker spaces and loads of information on the internet and it's easier than ever to reach your markets to sell stuff um, and loads of people sharing stuff. But at the same time, it's also super exceedingly difficult to actually manufacture stuff and get all the things done. Um, and you end up with these weird, like, bootstrapping stuff really difficult because um, you're, you're in this, like, perpetual kind of split world where... Like stuff looks like it's going really, really well, but at the same time, it's like, well, actually, maybe it's yeah, maybe we're almost broke at this point. Or like, you know, you talk to people about whether you're busy or not, and it's like, I'm always busy because I've got client work that I'm trying to do, which is going to pay the bills, and then I've got like product developments and all this additional stuff that I'm trying to make happen. So there's always too much stuff to do, but at the same time, you know, sometimes it's like kind of busy quiet or something, or like where you're busy with stuff to do but quiet with things that are going to pay the rent next month and like this sort of stuff is just tricky and difficult and like you know part of what the community does I guess is it's you know we support each other through those sorts of things and help people get through it um, and so I guess I'm sort of thinking that this is like kind of what what I've been doing the past decade is sort of strategic bootstrapping so like some of it was like, well, I'm going to need a load of tools and to learn a load of new things and a load of people around me to help do that. So one of the things to do that is to build a makerspace, which then takes loads of my time as well, which is you know, back to the kind of busy paying the bills, this is all complicated. Um, but you, you know, building the makerspace gives you the ability to then go and do stuff and, and be able to manufacture things. And that also comes from the networks of people of who you're going to work with who your suppliers are going to be, how you're going to learn those different skills that you need. And it's this kind of idea that I'm, I'm not, this isn't a lifestyle business that I'm building. It's not about being this thing where it just pays the rent and I can have a nice time. Like, this is a lifetime business. This is a long term thing that's going to change you know, the world. And I might not be the biggest company in the world, but I'm also not going to be the smallest, I hope. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's looking at stuff in a, a sort of time scale that's different from most of the other things that, that seem to want to do stuff. So, yeah, like, I suppose, yeah, we're going to have this conversation again in, like, a decade or something, aren't we? <laughs> we'll see where it goes to. But, um, yeah, thank you very much. Awesome.